to a brand new series of Games Master. Other shows may come and go, we just keep on coming. Which is why I'd like to start by introducing you to Teresa and Leanne, my two mermaid helpers for this series. Good evening, ladies. Hi. Hi. What are you looking forward to the most about this series? Um, what I'm looking forward to mainly is seeing all the smiling faces on the children around. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the violent games where people chop people's heads off. Why mermaids, I hear you ask? Well, observant people who pay close attention to expensive opening title sequences may have sussed we are in Atlantis. For new viewers, I should point out that we deal in video games and new entertainment technology. Between now and February, at least 30 extremely famous people will be coming on the show, laughing at everything I say and performing video game challenges while trying to retain an ounce of credibility. That's all coming up a bit later on, but we begin with a recap on the state of play games-wise at the dawn of this fine series, and one machine dominates everything. Yes, the biggest news since we were last on air has been the Japanese and American release of the Nintendo 64. The most powerful games console yet produced has been selling many, many, many units since its launch, but unfortunately for us, Europe seems to come rather low on Nintendo's priorities. The machine won't be available here until April and will be sold at 250 quid, over 100 notes more than Yang blokes are paying for it. Only three games are available as yet, but there are plenty more in the pipeline. Competing with Virtua Fighter and Tekken is Killer Instinct Gold, an update of the Killer Instinct 2 arcade machine featuring up to 90 hit combos. Also from Rare is Blast Core, which is a get in heavy machinery and demolish everything type situation. The first Doomstar shoot em up will be Turok Dinosaur Hunter, which bizarrely enough involves hunting dinosaurs and bearing the name of Turok. From Nintendo itself come three updates on some old classics. Star Fox 64, in which our furry forest friends clamber into spaceships and engage in interplanetary war. Kirby's Air Ride features everyone's favourite, shapeless pink ball. And the one we're all dying to play, Super Mario Kart 64, which if it's even half as good as the SNES version, will be twice as good as Hepatitis. These games are all in the future, but the game that set the standard that everyone has to meet is undoubtedly Mario 64, which is surely the most compelling reason to hurl your financial spew on the new machine. Many people are calling it the greatest game ever written, and indeed, the first event of this new series features none other than the wee plumber himself. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to my deep-sea domain. My first challenge couldn't be on anything but Mario 64 on the Nintendo 64. And I prepared a particularly difficult task to get things rolling. First, my hapless contestant must negotiate the formidable platform perils of the final level in which nerves of steel are required if he's to avoid falling to his doom. Next, I'm assuming he's still alive, he must take on the awesome spectacle of Bowser, the game's final opponent, and a creature armed with an array of unpleasant weapons. I'll give my contestant three minutes to complete both parts of the challenge, a measly amount that leaves little room for error. So, please welcome our first contestant of the series, Mr. Nathan Souch. <laughs> Young man, I do like your apparel. Uh, what kind of message are you trying to give us about Nathan Souch with that outfit? Look at me, love me, adore me. <laughs> now, you're a carpenter, Nathan. I would never have thought you down as a carpenter. Why is that? I, I would have thought you kind of either club DJ or petty criminal or something. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You've got that kind of trendy yet dangerous look. Now, you bought an N64 and import. Yeah. How much did it cost you? Three hundred pounds. Three hundred pounds. Some people have been paying up for like six, seven hundred, eight hundred, didn't they, when yeah, it first came yeah. out? Was it? Has it been worth your three hundred pound wad? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, Nathan, if you'd like to go and sit down, and uh, I will go up to the call commentary box. Okay, in the series one, he was playing old Kirk Ewing. In this series, he is playing old Kirk Ewing from Viz. Congratulations on getting. Employment, Kirk. Thank you very much. Let's hope it lasts. Okay, now, Mario, the possessor of a very fine moustache. Indeed. Kirk, how important is facial hair in the 90s? Well, facial hair is very important in the 90s. And, of course, Mario is sporting a fine moustache, as popularised by David Seaman. And many of our nation's police force. Yes. 
OK, Kirk, um, the, the first part of this challenge, platform oriented. What tips can you give Nathan? Well, this is the platform game of the moment. The best tip I can give him at the moment is to uh, try and use the camera well so that you can see round the various platforms because it can be a bit tricky in the perspective and you obviously want to see where you're going. OK, then. This is a two-part challenge. The first part is on the final platform section of the game. Nathan has three minutes in total to do both parts of the challenge. We reckon he really wants to be doing the first one in certainly less than two minutes to have any kind of a chance against Bowser in the final part. Best of luck then, Nathan. Your time begins now. So, uh, off goes Nathan. That's Mario, a very familiar um, red-hatted character. A bit of a seesaw action there, Kirk. Seesaw start. action straight onto the checkered platforms. You notice he turned the camera right away there. It has given him an extreme advantage. And he's ah, used that extreme... Was that very, a shortcut there? That was a shortcut. Hits the button and up pop the steps. And he's just got to get up to the top of the steps before they disappear, turn flat again, and he slides down. Well, he's successfully done that. He's been off for 22 seconds. Onto some kind of Lego texture thing here, Kirk. It's the Lego texture. Up the top is a... Oh, oh, He's got a burning bottom, it's a Vindaloo experience car. <laughs> it certainly is. But he stopped on that one, you don't want to experience that thing twice in a day. But he's done this very well, he's not lost a lot of health. And uh, on he comes, and he's got to keep running along, jumping over these blocks, and then back on the platform to keep going. So basically his pace is dictated by the pace of the platform car. So that's going to be exactly true. He's going to be quite slow in this bit, oh, but he's, uh, okay, he's safely over that. Onto some revolving platforms now, where's he going to go now, Kurt? He's going to go right up the pole here, shimmy up as fast as his little legs can carry him. An experience that we're all familiar with from the gym. In school, Kirk? Uh, certainly I am not. <laughs> okay. For one minute, 12 seconds, good remember, we're looking for under two minutes at the end of this section. Another sliding platform. Another here, sliding Kirk. platform. This one comes out up to the top of the pole. And yet another sliding platform, just like you would experience in daylight. Okay. <laughs> he is just evading little black bomb guys and everything. Yep. On yet now, don't tell me it's some more revolving platforms, Scott. You've got it. Some more checkered revolving platforms, this time revolving. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, another set. Yep. This okay. is just what we expect. He's been going for one minute 40 seconds. In the horizon there, you can see the green pipe. That's what he's got to get down, Kurt. What's this little... This is, this, is, this is sort of wind blowing towards him, a very interesting, expensive particle system they're using here. But he's got to just get down the green pipe, okay. and that's the first 152, part. 152, 153, and he's through the pipe. That's the first part of the challenge completed. Well done, Nathan. We're now going to go into our review section. The idea is cunningly simple, okay? We take a video game, right? And we say whether it's good or bad, allowing you, the viewer, to make a more informed purchasing choice. Everyone's a winner. No longer do you have to go to Thailand with middle-class kids to enjoy jet skiing. You can invite them to your council estate and do it there with Wave Racer 64. There are three main styles of play inside Wave Racer 64. There's the two-player split-screen mode, where you frantically race around in very Mario Kart style -y. There's also points attack where you have giant rubber rings that you have to sail through and occasionally go over cunning stunts just to earn yourself points. And then there's finally time attack where you just basically race around any set course just to beat your own lap time. Problem is, there's not so much of a feeling that you must break all your lap times. And in two-player mode, it's not really as much fun as it could have been. It's just you and your friend driving round and round a course. It's not to say it's bad, it's still brilliant and it's really good fun, but it's just not going to keep you going as long as some of the really, really hot race games. And finally, a quick look at the game which drew its inspiration from those classic Claire Rayner ads, Pilot Wing 64. As with the original Super Nintendo Pilot Wings, the idea of Pilot Wing 64 is to complete set missions. There are about 27 in total, covering three different contraptions. You've got the jetpack, the gyrocopter, and the hang glider. The problem I have with Pilot Wings N64, though, is the graphics themselves. They're not very good, not in comparison with other N64 games. But the gameplay is so superb and so engrossing that it really doesn't matter. Information-starved punters with internet access can get more background on these and other games by visiting our webpage, a veritable cornucopia of Games Master-related shenanigans. We'll give you the address again at the end of the show. OK, once a week on the show, I like to meet someone who I've always wanted to meet. Uh, often, 
this would happen to be a very attractive lady. Now, broadcasting regulations forbid me from doing this without some spurious reason attached. We like to call this our celebrity challenge. I have always enjoyed water sports, so I thought I'd indulge myself on the brand new arcade title, Aquajet. Perched precariously on an alarmingly realistic Aquajet, my contestant will speed toward the finishing line before the precious seconds run out. Time extensions are available along the way, as are a number of spectacular jumps, and contestants should avail themselves of both if they're to avoid an early bath. It gives me especially great pleasure to introduce today's guest because I feel like I've grown up with this woman uh, from uh, when I was a very, very young man. I have studied her career very, very closely indeed. Please welcome Sam Fox. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. If it's not too premature to say that. <laughs> Sam, uh, there are two big aspects to your career. Yes, uh, there certainly is. You've got the, the modelling and the singing. I want to talk about the singing. You are huge all over the world. Where are your biggest? Um, I would say America is probably my biggest market. Yeah. Japan, um, France. Do you have to translate the names of your singles in different countries? In some cases, um, with certain records I do, for certain territories I do the choruses in their language, uh -huh. like in French or even sometimes I've attempted Japanese. So, do you want it, to give us a burst of any of those? Well, I know like uh, Konnichiwa, which is um, hello. Hello, yeah. Have you had a song called Hello? No, I haven't actually, but maybe we should do one together. Hello. We could do Lionel Richie. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Is <laughs> it me you're looking for? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and I could say yeah. Just uh, a little thought of Okay, let's, um, you're playing the Aquajet today, I Sam. Am. Is this the first time you've participated in water sports? Uh, no, I actually do jet ski when I go on holiday. I love uh -huh. that. This is the first time, obviously, I've been on a machine like this. I hope it's very similar. Okay, so after the break, we'll have Sam up on the Aquajet, and we'll have another climax on Mario 64 event. We'll be back quite literally in a minute. <laughs> to Games Master. Well, for years I've been trying to make her come. Sam Foxo is finally on the show. We're very happy about that. She's about to play Aqua Jet and I'd like to welcome back an old friend from last series, Mr. Derek Lynch beside me in the comedy box. Okay, well, Derek, you are from Namco Wonder Parks. Uh, you know all about Aqua Jet. Give Sam some advice. Well, what Sam has to watch out for, as Aquajet picks up speed, just remember to lean, gra lean gracefully into those curves to keep control, and also to hit the ramps square in the middle. Okay, and thank you very much, speed. Derek. Sam has to get round one lap before her lot of time runs out. Best of luck, Sam. Off you go. Okay, we can see the time at the top of the screen. 34 seconds left. There will be time extensions as Sam gets through various stages in the course. Top left, I've got You can see a map, and that did this half around the course. She is. She's doing a good start. She's up to 10th place, but we're not worried about the placing there. We're just going to see a nice smooth ride. That's right. She has control there. She hasn't hit the side. She's moving quite well there, leaning into the curves, keeping nice control. That's great. She doesn't want to take the turns too wide, though, because obviously that's going to start to slow her down a little bit. That's right. But it's, it's going very well. Bit of a time extension there. 39 seconds left. Big jump coming up yeah. there. If she hits this jump well, she's doing it well. Great. Straight on and then immediately into a right hand off. But this is still okay. 30 seconds left. She can still do it there, Derek. That's right, she can. If she's very careful between this cave. Okay, through the cave. And uh, oh, where's the floor gone? Oh, she's under the water. She's <laughs> under the water. I thought we'd lost her. I thought I was going to have to dive in and apply mouth to mouth there, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Will she get our time extension soon, Derek? Yeah, looks like she's going very well, handling the, the waves. Here we go, this is our time extension coming up. 30 seconds, I think that's our last one now, Derek. Okay, she's moving, taking this, this curve. Will she move, avoid those bo Yes, she has. That's great, no, it's almost a chicane there now. Jump contest, Derek. She wants to take the big one straight on, doesn't she? She's done it. Yeah. Number two. Here's the first one. Number three, the third big one. Oh! Not quite on the small one, but that's still not bad. 11 seconds left to finish the race. I think it's just round this turn. Then the left hand, I think it's going to do it for the time. closest challenges we've ever had yes. uh, on any series of Games Master. How, tell us how it felt then, going around wielding this huge big machine. <laughs> 
Well, it, actually, it's, it's um, very realistic, I must say. Uh -huh. It's very close to the real thing. Um, uh, what about when you were coming near the end? Were you worried at any point you weren't going to do it? Yeah, I, the big jump when, when, you go, when I went under the water, I was, I was uh -huh. kind of thinking, well, how am I going to get out of this? But I, I lifted the thing up, I don't know what it's called, the, um, the handlebars. Things fine, handlebars. And um, I pushed them up, and I seemed to come out of the water, and it was, re it was really good. It's amazing what can happen when you lift things up. It, so. uh, you, you watch it, you. I'm going to... Um, <laughs> that wasn't bad. I managed to go about two or three questions there, Sam, without seeing anything remotely rude. It's great. It's a sign of intelligence, you know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, right, I'm not even going to try this now. Sam Fox has got the better of me. I'm going to bow out gracefully. Thank you very much for coming Thank on, you. Sam. Thank you. Cheers. And uh, you are uh, one of my favourite winners of the Golden Games Master Joystick! <laughs> Uh, we extend to all our guests here at Games Master is uh, very good indeed. So while I go and help Sam get changed, remember we have got the Mario 64 event still going on. We'll catch up on that after today's feature. <laughs> sitting at home thinking, oh, once again, Dominic's been jetted off to the other ends of the world to laze about on some beach. Well, you're exactly right, except this time the beach, like 70% of my body, is artificial. Forget your weenie water parks, this is the largest man-made beach in the world, located uh, right next to the real beach over there. I'm actually in the Sagaya Beach Resort in Japan, and obviously I'm something of a cultural ambassador for my country, which is why I have brought the British Beach Essentials, football top, knotted hanky, and large British belly. Now, luckily enough, here's one I made earlier. Sagaya is a total Guinness Book of Records type place. Apart from the biggest automatic roof in the world, it has a beach made entirely of ground marble and a wave machine that generates 10-foot breakers. Of course, uh, this being Japan, the beach itself is just one of a multitude of attractions on offer to the jaded jet setter. OK, this may well be the most high-tech resort on the face of the planet, but they still have queues, obviously, to make British people feel at home. This ride is called the Water Crash. You have to watch film of, uh, like, water-orientated stuff, and you get splashed with water in a kind of tribute to the gunge tank on those house parties. The idea is to terrify the audience by simulating a white water rapids ride. Personally, I was more terrified by the potentially disastrous combination of real water and high-voltage electrical equipment. By this point, I'd had quite enough water-related jollies, thank you for asking, so I moved on to the Adventure Theatre, the biggest motion control cinema in the world. The ride was designed by George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic Boys and takes you on a stomach-churning interplanetary jaunt. Not something I'd recommend after ten curries and a pint. The Ocean Dome cost $400 million to build. Now, for that money, you could get a living Alan Shearer's and some of his mates as subs. All that money, and it's all controlled from this one room by this one wee guy here. Have you ever pushed the wrong button by mistake? Yes. What, what happened? Hmm. Impressive technology is all very well, but come on, we all know the real reason why people go on holiday. Do you get a lot of single people coming, like gangs of boys, gangs of girls? Yes, yeah. enjoying day doing it. Uh-huh. Is it a good place to pull? Yes, I think so. Yeah? Yes. Oh, excellent. Have you pulled? Not pulled. Pardon? Have you pulled? When, when British people go on holiday, they try to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Oh. It's called pulling. So have you I pulled? Just, I just go to Japan for sightseeing. No, no. I have a girlfriend already in Hong Kong. All right, okay. But so why didn't you bring her here? Because it is very expensive. Right, and you wanted to go in the pool, didn't you? You did. <laughs> I see. I got. A hard day's pulling at Sagaya is rounded off by the light show, a technological frenzy of lasers, water cannons, and appallingly cheesy acting. It's a monument to bad taste, guaranteed to send you to bed in a hurry. Sagaya is Japan's ultimate high-tech holiday solution, and no doubt in the not-too-distant future, all of us will be spending our holidays in something similar.
I can hardly wait. Okay, it's all about to get rather exciting here because young trendsetter Nathan Souch has earlier on in the show completed the first part of his two-part challenge on Mario 64 on the N64. He got right through the final platform bit. Now he's got to do battle with Bowser in the game's very, very final level. We gave him three minutes to do both parts. He took one minute 53 to get past the platforms. Now all you young mathematicians out there will know that leaves him one minute and seven seconds for the final part. Kirk, is that enough time? That is just about enough time, but he cannot make one mistake at all. I mean, I've never seen this done in that sort of time scale. He's really just going to get in there and get it right first time. How does he get it right? What he does is he gets uh, uh, Bowser to try and chase him to the edge, does a somersault over the back, grabs him by the tail and throws him into one of the bombs that are placed round about the edge of the platform. If he can do that three times, then he's got the big guy down. Okay, best of luck, Nathan. One minute, seven seconds to do it. Your time starts now. Okay, so he lands in the bag as well. There is the big guy. And he's saying, where am I having for that Dexter Fletcher bloke from Series 3? Okay, he's running. Is Bowser going to chase him now, Kirk? Bowser should just chase him now. now the, oh, he's perfect. Does a somersault over the top, grabs him by the tail. That's wow. it. That's the first one. The first eight. Two minutes, 12 seconds. Smasher. Okay. Once again, round to the next bomb. You see, you can see him here. And Bowser's just got a little sniff of his scent here. Off he goes. Another perfect jump. Successfully behind the big fella. the tail and wallop. Again, two minutes, 27 seconds gone, 30 seconds left. Kurt. This looks quite easy though. Yeah, well, what's going to happen now is that once we get two of the bombs, bits of the platform start to drop away. Now, this makes it considerably harder because you've got to aim right out towards the bomb. Oh, and Bowser sent out one of these kind of small thermonuclear devices there. Which have happened in all our pants in the past, Kurt. Not mine. Okay, he's only got 15 seconds left here. He's basically going to have to hit the bomb first time, Kurt. Yep, using a little analog joystick to spin him round, which is looking great at the moment. That's a big old swing, but he's going to have to hurry. He's got four spins left. Oh. That's it. He's done it. Bowser tops it with four seconds left. <laughs> Nathan Sykes, the first winner of the series. What well a Nathan. Okay. Now, uh, four seconds left at the end there. It's quite tight, but you didn't look as if you were ever in any trouble. Uh, were you at all? No, not really. But Bowser can turn nice sometimes, so... Mm -hmm. You've always got to bear that in mind. Always got to bear that in mind. Now, uh, you are quite literally the first punter to uh, win against Master Golden Joystick of this series. What does that mean to you, Nathan? I've fulfilled my destiny. Well, uh, destiny is um, uh, one of many things we like to fulfill on this show. Congratulations. Uh, the game's Master Golden Joystick goes to Nathan Souch. <laughs> safely in the bag and next week we've got more N64 shenanigans with an exclusive playing and showing of Killer Instinct Gold plus Red Dwarf's Danny John Jules on the show. We'll see you in seven days time and I leave you with this thought. Instead of going through intense princess rescuing related traumas once every year, why doesn't Mario just get himself a new bird? Good night.